I know him as somebody I travelled the country with covering Forest games. You'll know him as a former Forest midfielder in two spells who also went to two World Cup finals as well. Over coming weeks, you'll hear Steve Hodge on his Forest story. Fascinating it is as well, so don't miss that in coming weeks. Now, though, he'll talk to you about Forest promotion to the Premier League. Steve Hodge, next. Roger, great to catch up again. Um, I want to talk to you about, obviously, your time at Forest as a player, but let's start with this season because it seems the obvious place yeah. to start. You sat in the commentary box watching. How how good was this season? It was um, probably, well, I've been for eight seasons now, I think it is. So, you know, as you know, the previous probably seven weren't very exciting, <laughs> really. There were the odds, yeah. the odds, possible playoff spot event, you know, possibility, but... That never transpired. So um, obviously, the first seven games was horrific this year, and we were all. I think I think Colin was the same, just thinking doom and gloom, and here we go again. And you know, let's try and get mid-table at best this season and start again next year. Um, but it was early, actually, in, in Steve Cooper's reign when it, it just it flipped so quickly. You know, the kind of the. Um, the intensity of the play and the style of the play and the the uh, the connection between Steve Cooper and the, the fans and the players was more or less immediate, which you don't often get sometimes. People warm to people sometimes and so do players. But with Steve Cooper, it was immediate, really. And I think his first home game was drawn against Millwall, which wasn't great, but nobody was really panicking then. But after that, obviously, there was a 4 0 against Fulham at home when we weren't that bad, really. But on paper, obviously, Fulham can hurt you, as they did that day. Um, but it just flipped over so quickly and the players played with freedom and just seemed to be quite happy that the, the previous manager had gone, or very happy. Um, and they played with a real joy and expression and they were young lads and they wanted to be guided by somebody who they could relate to. Um, and it seems that Steve Cooper is really good with young players. Uh, as you see with England on seven teams and then Swansea was a quite a young team as well. Um, so he took off from there and... You know, I thought early October, November that they'd be in top six because apart from Fulham, who were consistently doing well, Bournemouth had a bit of a wobble around Christmas time. Um, but the rest were much of a muchness, really. The Sheffield United and Middlesbrough were struggling. Huddersfield and Luton were doing brilliantly. Blackburn were up there. But I wasn't scared by any of them, really. Um, and seeing how well Forest were playing, you're thinking, well... You know, if we can keep this up now and, and recruit well in January, and the crew was brilliant in January, they brought in Cook, mm. Davis, and um, and Surridge. Um, it, it, the managers hardly put a foot wrong in the whole season, and whatever he kind of tried came off. Uh, the players who came in did well when they got injuries, people filled in, like Jack Colback and Ryan Gaines, the centre half, and um, and it just it just nothing went wrong. It was from, from being bottom of the league to finishing. Yeah, just fourth. It could have been third on the last day. But obviously, the last goal at Hull, last, uh, last goal, last minute goal at Hull, maybe we, maybe we was fourth rather than third. But but from, from bottom to nearly third in in 30, 38, 39 games it was you know. I often say to people, I hear the word amazing used about food on TV or an amazing looking dog or which to fair there are some amazing looking dogs, but the <laughs> word amazing is used by everybody about a cup of tea or whatever it might be nowadays. And when I was growing up, the word amazing meant uh, the pyramids was amazing and the Great Wall of China was amazing and they were amazing. So it's used so much nowadays, but from what Steve Cooper did from where he went to was an amazing achievement. It really was. So how did he do it? I mean, because Chris Hewton, I mean, your former teammate of yours, isn't he, Chris Hewton at, at Tottenham, but... You look at his yeah. CV and you go, yeah, he knows exactly what he's doing. He'll have been in every situation pretty much at a football club in his career as a manager. So how yeah. does it go for... It's not as though they they've tried an inexperienced manager who was out of his depth. He's an experienced manager who's been there and done it. He can't get yeah. a tune out of the players. And almost from the moment Steve Cooper comes in, they're singing a different tune. Yeah, I actually think it's down to chemistry. Um you're right, Chris Hewton, you know, his CV was great. And I thought, what a good appointment, what a good fit. But it didn't work. And, you know, it, it must have been the chemistry between the players. And Chris Hewton was, was, wasn't there. And once you lose three or four people in a, in a changing room that's, you know, wanting guidance, wanting um, 
some authority, it just doesn't happen. Uh, but it did happen in a bad way. I mean, to lose that first what is it, six out of seven was... Uh, but the football was just... There was no intensity. There was no spark. There was no um, togetherness. It was a team that was just counting the games away, really. So whatever Steve Cooper has, and I don't know, I've met him once, actually, when I was a manager of Forest under 15s and we played Liverpool under 15s uh, at their training ground. Um, and I didn't know who he was, to be fair. I knew Mike Marsh was number two on that day. I knew him from playing against him, but Marsh was two and he was number one to Cooper. So I thought, well, obviously, he's, I don't know him, but Marsh has been around and Cooper's number one. So he's obviously experienced and knows his stuff. Um, I remember that day we played Liverpool. We lost 2 0, but the re- it was at their training ground. I remember the referee was a complete homer. <laughs> and, and, I, and I remember at some point, I think they got a penalty or, or we had a goal disallowed. And I remember looking at Steve Cooper and saying something about the referee and he, he had to go back at me and I had to go back at him. Because <laughs> you do. Try and keep your I dignity, Hodgie. <laughs> well, I was, I was defending my, what I thought was a referee was favouring the home team, which he undoubtedly was because he was at Liverpool's home ground. And, and Steve After Cooper Huddersfield in the playoff final, you cannot complain about referees, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> but on that day, I don't know, 15 years ago... Um, when I first met Steve Cooper, uh, I remember we had a bit of a go on the touchdown with each other, you know, and afterwards it was all forgotten. But I didn't forget him, to be fair. I just thought, well, you know, you've, you've, you've kind of like stood your ground there and, you know, you've, you've said your piece and you, you've won the game 2-0 and, you know, and we move on. So I, I didn't lose track of him because he, he actually went to, um, I took the under-15s to uh, a youth tournament in Menorca about a year later. Um I remember he was there again with Mike Marsh taking Liverpool under 15s and in the same tournament, and I passed him across that time. So I know he'd been around the youth system at Liverpool for quite a long time, and then he arrived at England and did an unbelievable job in that year when we were champions in the 20s, under 17s, and he really made his name there. So whatever he has, he's he's with young players. Obviously, studied it really well, and he's he has a personality that lends itself to young players and young people. Um, Money can't buy that, really. He has something in his chemistry, in his DNA, that that young players listen to, want to do well for. They like him as a person. And when, obviously, everyone likes... If you like somebody as a person, you might try a bit harder for them. Um, and the players this year, from minute one, have done that. And whatever he's done in terms of changing their tactics or um, changing the tactics during games or leaving a player out and bringing another player in, it just seemed to have been seamless and absolutely. He, he must, he must, he must sometimes sit in his office thinking, "Wow, did that go well?" And he mm. must think, "I got that all right. Everything I thought might happen did happen. I changed it, and that happened, and we got the result." And I know Garner came on for me at Barnsley and changed the game, you know, because Garner wasn't a regular start of the season. He was a bit in and out, and it was cold back in the middle with Yates and blah blah blah. Um, so, you know, all I can do is commend the job he did. Because even if this year we'd finished six, missed out on the playoffs again or whatever, you still say, what a season from where they were to where they were eventually. And it was great to watch. It, it brought the whole thing together. And the fist bump thing and, and that, you know, to get the fans on the side, it's something probably, apart from Piercy probably, I don't think I saw Karenko or Chris Hutton, Philip Montagnier, Savile Lemouchi a little bit, but none of them had that connection. Compared yeah. to what even Billy, guys... Billy had a connection, but not with with everybody yeah. in the way that Steve Cooper has. He's a young man. He's 41, 42. You know, he, he wears he wears his own. I have to say, he's worn the same stuff nearly every game. I assume he's superstitious because it's, it's served him really well. <laughs> but he's, he has, he has, you know, he wears young man's gear, and he just seems to be a young man still. And, and they can relate to all the players, and they like that. And he just he's a likable kind of guy. I'm sure deep down there, there's a oh, there has to be a tougher side when things are going to go against him, or well, as, I, as I know to my cost on the touchline yes. before <laughs> when he wants to, he, he will stand up for things and he, he will say his piece. But, um, you know, it's been a, a fantastic nine months for him personally as a manager. And I, I wonder sometimes where he sits and thinks, wow, I, I didn't think we'd be in this position when I joined in nine months ago that we'd be going up. I think he'd be thinking, let's, let's you know, stabilise, let's get the club forward. Um, but after his last two years at Swansea, he deserves to be in the Premier League. Three, three years, three playoffs, job done. There is more to come from Steve Hodge in a moment. Need to thank my members of Chippers Club, particularly the gold members, who this week are Danny Moriarty, William Hutton, Nick Hemphill, 
Ant Adam, Damien Miles, Christian Tonnies, James Sordon, Henny the Hero, Tiny Media, Philip Sheldon, Paul Harrison, Thomas Newton, Mark German, Alan Francis, David Shelton, Mark Davis, Ez Chowdhury, Paul Metcalf, Tim Hayward, Richard Waterhouse and Ian Russell. Thank you for continuing to be a gold member of Chippers Club. If you want to sign up and get all the benefits, the link is in the description below. Let's get back to Steve Hodge. I was going to talk to you about the connection with the fans because obviously I mentioned Billy Davis had that kind of connection and, and that was probably the last time the city ground was, to use a phrase, a fortress. But I always go back to Aitor Karanka who upset some fans post-match once when he talked about the city ground. I can't remember the exact game, but the the fact they were 1-0 down with 15 to go and it was dead quiet. And he made a point about it and what a difference it could make if the fans got right behind and, you know, shouted on. And I wonder how much that, I mean, it came from Cooper and the players to start with, but how much difference that has made to them this season. Is that the game when you said it off there afterwards, he was in a bit of a strange mood that day? No, I, I think that was a different game. That was against Ipswich, where he's, I, I said, I said to him, "You, for some, you know, they'd won two 0 and I said, "You didn't, you don't seem very happy." And he said, "I wasn't." And about a month or six yeah. weeks later, he was, he was, he'd gone. But this was a different yeah. game. This was before it when I can't right. remember the precise game, but he'd said something about the fans need to get behind the side. It was quiet. Last fifteen minutes, they're one 0 down, and I can't remember if he drew the comparison with Leeds. But a few weeks later, they played Leeds and Leeds were 1-0 down at home to Forest. And at Ellen yeah. Road, it was very, very noisy that last 15 minutes, you know, right behind the side. And he kind of, yeah. I think it kind of hit home a little bit there what he was talking about. Yeah, um, I, I kind of I kind of know what he's saying, but, you know, you can't really say that, really. You can't, you can't really go on the radio and start saying to the fans, not it's your fault, but, you know, you're no, part no. of the fault. Really? You, you, you can't do that. And, you know, like I mentioned about personality, with all due respect, and Karanka's won the Champions League and Mourinho's mate, and you name it, I think he's now in La Liga again with the team there. I think it's Granada in La Liga. So, he's, you know, he's been around some royalty in football, but he didn't have a great personality at Nottingham when he came here, really. I didn't feel he had like Steve Cooper. He didn't have that connection with the fans or the players. I think he was... What I'm told about him, he was a bit standoffish and wasn't didn't give a lot to the players in terms of uh, personal, um, you know, advice. Um, and those little things, obviously, you know, when he's come from a foreign land, it's never easy to connect, connect with people. But Steve Cooper can because he knows where, you know, Manchester is. And he can talk to people about, you know, the Scouse accent and have a bit of banter with people about the parts of the UK that he knows about. Whereas mm. Karanka really wouldn't know that. So I think Karanka was more of the studious you know, standoffish, we'll do it this way type. And I think it I think I think it was his rule was the law and that was it. No real interaction or no real chat. So, you know, I, I do think it's about personality. I really do. I think I think a lot of good players out there now, we see it a lot, a lot of good players um want guidance, a lot of young players. And the game is now about young men nowadays, a lot younger than when I started off. Um, they get their first teams a lot younger. They want guidance quickly, they want their career on the rails quickly and going upwards. And they want somebody they believe in who they can relate to. Uh, I think that's why some sometimes people like Karanka, they've got the CV. Um, they're not the right fit for the group of players that we had here at that time who were predominantly quite young. Um, you know, we obviously, there was Lewis Graben, he was, I think probably will we'll move on now. I think he's out of contract, but it was it was quite a young squad. Um, and maybe Chris Hewitt was, was, as they say nowadays, a bit old school. The likes of, you know, they're not really hanging on now, to be fair. David Moyes is the one to come back at West Ham, but the likes of Sam Allardyce and Tony Pulis and Chris Hewton, you know, in the they, they don't get mentioned anymore, do they, for jobs in the way no, that they got mentioned with every job a couple of years yeah, ago? I think, I think the way the game's gone now, that, that plus 60s, apart from David Moyes, I think he's 59, are being eased out now and looking for jobs. But, you know, Rob Edwards... He's now at Watford. I coached with Robert Wat- at Wolves seven, eight years ago with the, when I was doing a bit of Wolves for a year. Rob was there then. Really good, bright coach. Really enjoyed working with him. I do, I do think now it is a lot about, certainly in the Football League, about young managers coming through who are looking for the right place to be, like it was for Forest Green, Green Rovers for, for Rob, like it has been for Steve Cooper. I think you're going to get a lot more managers who get the badges earlier and in the maybe early 30s, mid 30s, early 40s, 
will get the right jobs. And the likes of Steve Cooper and, and Rob Edwards now are giving all these young managers, uh, want to be young managers who want to get in early. They give him a real good chance because it, it seemed to work. Whereas years ago, it was a bit like, you know, who can we kind of go for? Who's a guarantee to get the so and so? It will be an old stager. A Warnock, it, it, yeah. He used to fail. These managers used to fail all the time and get jobs again. He's think, how's he got that job again? How's he in again? He failed there because chairman were a bit un unsure about young managers, so they, they play safe. But they don't now. They gamble a little bit. So it's good to see. So what happens with Steve Cooper and Forrest next season, do you think? Is is the target 17th? Should that be the target? What what do you think they can achieve? Or, you know, does it depend on what they do during the summer? Uh, as a club, it, 17th would be fine um, because you can build your club then on the second year. Uh, obviously, the money is monstrous, so that's what you want to build your club. And I mean, I mean, in terms of the academy and the stadium and the infrastructure, and they're now in academies and that like Cat One. So the whole thing, not just the, the, the first team, but obviously that's, that's the main thing. But I think I think um, I think I'm looking better at 17th personally with the manager we have. I look at Brentford last year who came up, had a really good start, and then had a wobble up, then got then recruited Ericsson in January, and bang, they get they crack on. Um, on the flip side, you look at Watford and Norwich, didn't really invest too much, as those teams tend not to do, really, that they'll gamble a little bit. Um, and Watford bringing three or four unknown players. Norwich got Brandon Williams on loan from Man United, and Billy Gilmore from Chelsea, and a couple more foreign lads. So that wasn't a big outlay. And that tends to mean that you're going to be in trouble all season. And that's the reason why Watford and Norwich have gone down again. But in saying that, you know, the second season for Leeds was a disaster this year. They they very nearly went down this year. Um, and Sheffield, after their second year, they went down. So, you know, I, I genuinely think next year, if, if Steve recruits well, I'm, I'm not saying, I mean, I've got to mention also Dane Murphy, what a job he's done, by the way. What a job he's done because the players at, he brought in. At Barnsley uh, and North Forest as well, yeah. That, I mentioned Barnsley before that as well. Um, his CV, his recruitment of players who weren't fancied elsewhere um, and young players in the main, like Zinc and Argos, come, come in for Watford as well. Um, I'm, I'm confident those two, the manager and the recruitment officer, can bring in enough players of quality um, to make it a comfortable season. I genuinely think it'll be a comfortable season. If we, Obviously, if we can retrain Brennan Johnson, who knows? Uh, I think Spence will go. I think he'll go to a big hitter down south because he's a London boy anyway. Um, but from what I've seen elsewhere with Dave Murphy and, and Steve Cooper, you know, they have they have lots of contacts all over and lots of talk about the boy Brogia now from Southampton on loan, possibly coming in from Chelsea. Um, they'll have they'll have lists. I, and I genuinely think it'll be a list of young lads like Brogia, 21. He likes to get players in who are, are keen to make a name, have loads of motivation and desire. And you know, we've spoken over the years, I say to you, like, we've got too many 29 year olds in our team who are multi millionaires, mm. and it's not the way now. You know, they, they, they just, they're still good players and they still play well. Do you need but, a couple of those in yeah. the Premier League just to kind of, you know, I'm yes. trying to think of players as an example. But um, Colin Frey mentioned on, on here the other week about someone like a Jamal Lascelles who's played, yeah. I don't know, a couple of hundred off the top of my head Premier League games. Somebody like yeah. that. Do you need that? Yeah, possibly. Well, I think Jamal, obviously, I know Jamal from the UC and Forest, so he's, he's a good character. Um, they've obviously got Steve Cooper in, who's 30 himself. So if you bring in Jamal Lascelles and you've got Steve Cook and, and Joe Worrell still there with Scott McKenna, you've got four good centre-halves there. You might want another one just to spare because of injuries, but someone like that, yeah. Um, but I think I do think the striker wide and, and, you know, I say striker now, a lot of, a lot of strikers... There aren't many strikers around, man, is actually. Old-fashioned strikers. It's forwards now, and the forwards flit around. If, if you, to say, I was talking to my lad the other day about, if you look at the, the football now in the world football, you, you still see people giving contracts out to Luis Suarez at 35, Ronaldo 37, Modric at 36, um, Lewandowski at 34 nearly, Cavani at 35, Benzema at 34. There's a load of absolutely superstar players at 33, 34, 35, Messi, 35, who are, you'd think by now, shot and past it, but they're getting massive contracts because below them, striker-wise, 
there's absolutely nothing as a centre forward to go. There's not many in the world now. Apart from Harlan, Look at Man City, been. who've played basically a season largely without one. <laughs> you, you, from 29 to 30, which is Harry Kane, who's at 30 yeah. this month or next month, below that, that six or seven years, mm. past that to Mbappe and Haaland. You know, I can't think of many strikers who are centre forwards, not not a forward, centre forwards, the old fashioned Harry Kane type. There's hardly any in the world. It's all now about wingers, forwards who can flit around and play in different positions. You know, you see Mbappe playing for France now on the left wing or the right wing or whatever. Um, so there aren't many strikers around to go and get, really. Uh, obviously, we had last year we had Keenan Davis who did a fantastic job. Um, but I think I think it's it's now about players who can play in variety of positions in a front three. I think Steve likes to play a front three whenever he can, or he plays two up top and one in the diamond behind. Um, so I'm confident next year. I really am. I think it's a bright group. The manager's young still. I think they'll go on the the wave of euphoria from Wembley and the great season that they've had. The fans undoubtedly, you know, will, will realise they're in a high echelon of, of playing how they're playing against. But they'll be right behind them, and I think any any setbacks they get, you know, there'll be no, you know, as, as Steve says to be fair, a lot after every defeat this year, it's, it's bounce back ability. It's, it's happened consistently this season. They've got beat, and straight away they're on it again, and they get either a draw or a win. Um, and, and the fans just now are just loving just what they've seen the last nine months. As I said, if, if this year they've not got up, they've still seen a great season this year. So you know, it, it's probably hard for you to gauge from where you are. Obviously, a long way away, but. Um, the mood's been great all season, really, from the minute Chris Hewitt left, the Steve, Stephen, Stephen um, Reid took the team at Odyssey and got a result. Um, it's been on it from day one. I, th- I think the first seven games this year was that bad that people were, would, would, would accept it. anything that was half decent after that terrible yeah. period. <laughs> um, and, and to be fair, the year before or the season before was just as, as was, I think we were bottom scorers that year in the league. And there were some dour things, some dour, boring games to watch. Um, it, <laughs> I haven't missed much. <laughs> no, we used to come away from games and then come and thinking, "Oh, that was boring." Once it again today, and, and it, it was endless every week. It was it, home and away. It was just boring to watch. And I said to Colin, I think I mentioned on commentary when we last year that we finished last season with a front three of Glenn Murray, Lyle Taylor, and Lewis Graben, who had a combined age of like 102. And we finished this season with Sam Surridge, Kenyon Davis, and uh, Brendan Johnson, a combined age of about. 67, 66, whatever it was. It's a hell of a difference. It's the way it had to go. They have desire, they have they're fit, they're motivated, and they're all good players. Whereas you you 30 some things, money's in the bank, good players still, but if you want to get in the big league, you need a bit more than that. My thanks to Steve Hodge for his time. Keep an eye on the channel. There is much more to come from him about his Forest career. If you want to see more right now, you can watch Brian Laws talking about his time at Forest. He'll also tell you about not being in that FA Cup final. That is here. And also, perhaps a bit more up-to-date, Chris Cohen is here.